We're thrilled today to have Doug come. We're excited to have him here to talk about the vanishing landmarks here at home. He's done all kinds of photography work. So, Doug. Well, thank you, and good afternoon. I drive all over Minnesota taking pictures of historic places. And today the program is called Vanishing Landmarks. Things in Minnesota that are disappearing that really tell our story. One of the, my favorite landmarks when I find uh, a small town or a community, I look for something, and it's this particular type of landmark. How many know what it is? Yeah, it's a courthouse. We've all seen it, right? How many know where this courthouse is? Yeah, that's right. Somebody knows they're in Minnesota. This is in Stillwater. Do you know that this is our oldest courthouse building standing in the state of Minnesota? How many counties do we have in Minnesota? That's right, we have 87. I went to all of them. And this is our oldest courthouse building still standing in our state. It was built in 1864. What was going on in 1864? Yeah, the Civil War. You know, you can really feel the history when you walk in an old building like this that was built in the days of the, of the Civil War. Today, this is no longer being used as a courthouse. It's being used as an art center today. And you can rent the building out. It sits on the hill there in Stillwater. And if you want to get remarried, you can get married there. Any hands? OK. Uh, they, they rent it out for different events. They have anniversaries and, and different uh, things there. But it's a wonderful old building that's been preserved. And today, it's on the National Register. Oh, OK. Did you hear that? They give concerts here. Wouldn't that be a fun place to, to uh, hear a concert? Yeah, campaign. These are, are, are wonderful civic buildings, and we have 87 counties. But you know, we have 89 courthouses. Where'd the other two come from? Anyone know? St. Louis County. That's right. St. Louis County has actually three courthouses. Any particular reason why you think St. Louis County should have three? It's such a big county. St. Louis County is the county that comprises of Duluth, Hibbing, and Virginia. And that's why they have uh, three courthouses um, in that county. It's such a big county. Now, our oldest still in use courthouse was built a year after the Stillwater Courthouse. Anyone know where it is? How many have ever eaten at the Hubble House? Have you ever eaten there? Just up the road. What town are we in? Yeah, that's right, Manterville. Manterville is the county seat for Dodge County. This is where our oldest still in use courthouse in Minnesota is. It was built in 1865, one year after the Stillwater Courthouse and it's still being used and stands today. I think one of the reasons this courthouse has stood so long is in the old part that you see here on the screen, the walls are 40 inches thick. We've lost a lot of our old courthouses, unfortunately, though. And they are historic treasures that have been gone to history. How many grew up in a town that was the county seat of their town of their county? And what county is that? Lake County, Illinois. Lake County, Illinois, okay. Anyone else grew up in a county seat? Yes. Spring County, South Dakota. Okay, out in South Dakota, you grew up in county seat. You know, it was very important for towns to become the county seat. If you could be guaranteed to have the courthouse in your county, and if you could get the railroad to come into your town, you were almost guaranteed success. Now, I'm going to ask my friend back there on the videotape, if you could just focus the projector. There's a, there's a knob on the, on the console there. Just tweak it a little bit. Sometimes it drifts out of focus. There we go. Perfect. You know, us photographers, we're a little picky about things like that, aren't we? Anyone know what courthouse this one is? It's in LeCenter, Minnesota. This is LeSueur County. What stands at the top of 
of courthouse t domes in a lot of cases. A statue, right? Generally, what is the statue? Justice. Lady Justice stands there, right? And what does Lady Justice typically hold in her hands? The scales and a sword, right? At the top of the courthouse dome in the center of Minnesota, Lady Justice stands. But in 1923, a storm came through town and blew over the dome of the courthouse. They rebuilt it. But when the storm blew the dome over, Lady Justice was broken. So they put her back together, and they tried to find the scales that she was holding, but they were damaged. So you know what is being used as replacement scales? They're Hudson hubcaps. <laughs> you got to remember, 1923, that's what was available. Very cold town in Minnesota. Not Duluth. Duluth is cold, but it's not in Duluth. It's a county seat. It's not International Falls. I went to college here for a year. Not St. Peter. How about, yeah, someone just said it. Somebody said Bemidji. Who said Bemidji? Yeah. This is the, the courthouse and county seat of Beltrami County in Bemidji. Interesting stories come out of courthouses. One of my favorite stories happened in the 1950s in Bemidji. How many remember the 1950s when you were, we were all concerned about the Cold War? You remember the Russian concerns? We were concerned about nuclear war. Remember those days? Did anyone ever dig any bomb shelters? Some people did. Your neighbors did, right? Stored up food. And then, you know, kids at school, they would be trained in those civil air defense drills. You remember them? Remember hiding under your desk? Like that would really help? <laughs> you know, in Bemidji, they were concerned about that too. You know what they would do at night in the tower of the courthouse in Bemidji? They would put spotters with binoculars looking for Russian aircraft. Like Bemidji was a target. Can you imagine the Air Force general in Moscow? Fellas, tonight's target's Bemidji, Minnesota. But you know, that's what, what was going on in the world at the time. And we took it seriously, didn't we? We laugh about it today, but back then, no one was laughing. It's not a courthouse. It's another historic building in our communities that we've lost many of them over the years. Yeah, someone said it. It's a library. How many grew up with a town library? Weren't they great? You ever hear the term Carnegie Library? Do you know that Minnesota had a lot of Carnegies? In fact, we had 63 Carnegie Libraries in Minnesota. That was really a small number compared to Ohio and Indiana. Ohio had 242. We got 63. This is our oldest Carnegie Library in Minnesota. It was built in 1899 in the city of Duluth. Now, how did uh, a town get a Carnegie Library? You know, it was a really simple process. All you had to do was write a letter and ask for money. You wrote to the Carnegie Foundation. They were out east in New York, and you would write a letter, and you would get money. We should try that again. Maybe even fund these programs. Write a letter. And you know, a town would receive how much money? It was based on your population. For example, you got $2 per person in your town. So if you had 10,000 people in your town, you got a $20,000 check to build a library. You know, it wasn't long before towns began to inflate their population numbers. <laughs> and if you were caught lying, you didn't get any money at all. But you know, there were towns around Minnesota that didn't want a Carnegie Library. They wanted a library, but they didn't want a Carnegie. Any ideas why they wouldn't take free money? No, there really weren't a lot of strings attached. Somebody, I think, just said it. They didn't like Andrew Carnegie. That's exactly right. 
Andrew Carnegie was known as a big a business baron. And after the homestead strikes of the 1890s, and many workers were exploited and many of them were killed in the steel mills of Pennsylvania, owned by Carnegie. Towns said, we don't want his money. It's big business money. You know, the famous author Mark Twain was once asked about Carnegie's money. He was asked, is Carnegie's money tainted? His response is, it sure is. Taint mine and taint yours. <laughs> of the 63 Carnegie libraries in Minnesota, we have 32 left. And this is one of my favorite little libraries. It's in the town of Coleraine, up on the Iron Range in Minnesota. Isn't that a great little library? Built in 1916, still being used today. And again, I'm going to ask my friend to focus just a hair there. This projector is getting old, I think. There we go. Nope, back it up. There we go. Can you all read that? Carnegie Li Public Library? There's a little town in western Minnesota. It's got a great little Carnegie Library. How many have ever heard of Browns Valley, Minnesota? Browns Valley has a little library, probably the smallest Carnegie that I have found in Minnesota. And this is a great little library, more because of its interesting history. It was built in 1912. Six years after it was built, it was closed. Not permanently, but for a temporary three-month stint. You remember your Minnesota history, don't you? What was going on in 1918? First World War, something else very tragic on the home front was occurring in 1918. Yeah, the flu epidemic, you remember that? I mean, you don't remember it firsthand, but you remember hearing about it, right? The influenza epidemic that swept through America and actually swept through the world. In Minnesota alone, did you know that 6,000 people died of the flu? In the fall of 1918, in the, uh, in the early winter of 1919? Nationwide, we lost over six million people to the flu. The little library in Browns Valley served as a makeshift hospital. The hospital in town got so full, they closed the library and people were put up on cots. And before that, on Saturdays at the library, in the summer, in the spring and summer of 1918, before the flu occurred, Ladies would meet in the library and roll bandages to send to the war effort in Europe during World War I. After the flu occurred and the ec epidemic pretty much had fizzled out and people were getting back to normal, in the Browns Valley Library, they put a zinc line closet they built into the back of the library. They were so concerned that that flu bug was still around. When books would come back, if you were from a family that had the flu, the books that you brought back to the library were put in a zinc lined closet, and for 24 hours, they burned sulfur candles, thinking that would destroy the disease that might be attached to the books. Strange, isn't it? Happened here at this little library. What do you think that is? Not a library, it's not a courthouse. We all went to one. Yeah, we all went to a school. How many did not go to school? How many wish they didn't sometimes? My hand goes up. You know, yeah, this is a high school. Where are we at? Yeah, we're in Duluth. This is Central High School in Duluth. I love old schools. I have a whole book here called Schoolhouses in Minnesota. Central High School is a real treasure. It was built in 1888, rock that was quarried in a small town south of Duluth. You've all driven by it. Have you ever heard of sandstone? They had a big rock quarry there in sandstone, and the rock was brought up to Duluth on the railroad, and, and Central High School and many other historic buildings in Duluth were built from the rock quarry locally. 1888, the school was built. It closed in the 1970s or late 70s. 
and for a number of years it was slated for demolition. Recently, they've saved the building, and hopefully now it's been preserved and put on the National Register. Look at the detail above the, one of the doors. Do we build schools like that anymore? Now, how many went to a big city school? How many went to a small town school? How many went to a school that might have looked kind of like that one? They were small town community schools, very, very popular through much of the, the 20th century, till about 1960 or actually in the 50s, it, depending on where you went to school, school consolidation began to close these by the hundreds. This school is in a small town out by Morris called Donnelly. It's northwest of Morris. It was built in 1902 and it closed in the 1960s. Now, if you didn't go to a big city school and you didn't go to town school, how many went to country school? Maybe you went to a school that looked kind of like that one. How many grades? Yeah, usually eight, all in one classroom. And there was always that little school behind the school, <laughs> known as the outhouse, a vanishing landmark. Some of us are glad about that. You know, these little schools dotted the countryside by the thousands. I was just yesterday doing a presentation out in a small town out in western Minnesota called Hanley Falls. Yellow Medicine County had 98 country schools just in that one county alone. And today, none of them are open. In fact, where is the only country school left open? Does anyone know? Yeah, there's some in the Dakotas, I think, still going. We have one in Minnesota still in operation. Yeah, somebody knows where it is. The Northwest Angle. You know that little notch that goes into Canada? Way up there is where the last country school is in Minnesota called Angle Inlet is the town in fact in my newest book called Schoolhouses of Minnesota the last chapter has pictures from the last country school in Minnesota this year or this past year Linda Castle the teacher had three students Ben Jake and Sam all three brothers if the family moves the right way we're in big trouble aren't we Linda takes a snowmobile to school in the wintertime. She lives on an island in Lake of the Woods. I asked her when I was up there. I went up there in January. Nice time to go to the Angle, huh? January. I drove up to the Angle and visited with her and the three boys. And I said, what do you do in the spring and the fall when there's no ice on the lake? How do you get to school? Yeah, she has a boat. She takes a boat to school. How many took a snowmobile to school? Anyone here? How about a boat? I told the three boys at the last country school, I said, you guys are living history of attending the last country school, public education anyway, in Minnesota. There are some Amish schools and some parochial schools still going that would be classified as country one-room schoolhouses. Most of them, unfortunately, look like this. If the walls could talk, what stories they would tell. Any idea what this building served at one time? No, it was not a church. Not a community center. Somebody said it in the front here. A theater. I like old theaters. And you can tell this is a theater because of the name. Odeon is a Greek word for small theater. The Odeon is a, uh, in a little town in western Minnesota called Bellevue. It's out by Redwood Falls. As you can see from the date on the building, that's not an address number, that's a date. It was built in 1901 as a vaudeville theater. 
Vaudeville troops would come into Bellevue, a small farming community at the time and still is, and they would perform their, their acts and people would come from all surrounding towns and communities, towns like Wood Lake, towns like Echo, Montevideo, Maynard, Granite Falls. They would all come into Bellevue to see the show. In 1923, the Odeon got its first movie projector. What do you think the first movie was? Close. It was Rin Tin Tin. <laughs> the Odeon served many purposes along with the theater. In the 30s, it was the basketball gymnasium for the high school team. If you go in the Odeon, I didn't bring a picture of the inside, but the, the court, or the basketball court, went right up to the wall. In fact, there's about a two and a half foot space between the wall and the court line. Fans would stand along the walls and watch the game. The opposing team came along, they'd put their leg out. Interference from the crowd, you know, at the Odeon. I was doing a presentation in Minnetonka a few years ago and I showed this picture. And a fellow in the audience said, I played basketball for the Bellevue team at the Odeon back in the 30s. One week to the day, I'm in Apple Valley to a senior group. And I kid you not, a lady in the group said, that's my home. I was a cheerleader for the basketball team in the 1930s. <laughs> I got to get those two people together. <laughs> I like old theaters. Most of us don't remember the vaudeville days, but how many remember small town Main Street type theaters? This is running off the screen here a little bit, but you can make it out. It's called Main Street. These, these great art deco 1930s and 40s vintage theaters. And we're in the town of what? You can see it on the, yeah, Sock Center. How many have been to Sock Center? The famous author, Sinclair Lewis's hometown. You remember the, the book he wrote? Yeah. And what did he call Sock Center in the book? He didn't call it Sock Center. He gave it a, a name. Do you remember? You have to pick up the book again at your library. He called it Gopher Prairie. How much did it cost to go to the theaters? I got a nickel in the front. Anyone lower than a nickel? Three cents? How much did it cost for popcorn? A nickel for popcorn? You remember the Saturday afternoon or Saturday mornings going to the movies? You know, it's interesting that we didn't seem to complain too much about what was playing at the movies. Today I go to a movie complex, there's 15 choices. I'm so confused. In those days there was one choice. If you didn't like the movie, you stayed home. How many remember going to the Gopher? You might not remember the theater, but you remember Bridgman's next door, I know you do. That was not down on Hennepin, wasn't it? Theaters are a great classic reminder of our past. They're disappearing fast and we're losing many theaters. There's the Palace Theater in Laverne, Minnesota. Small towns. My friend from Hutchinson, where is she? Right there. He had a great theater and you still do. It's been restored now and um, for a while there it was in flux. It, they didn't know if they were going to keep it or not. Hutchinson has a great theater, obviously here in Laverne. One of my favorite names of theaters comes from a theater in Wadena. It's called the Cozy. Now, when, I don't care what's playing. I just want to go to the Cozy, right? Great names. But many of the small town Main Street theaters are, have been closed and they've been lost. And, and we have a few left, but they're rapidly disappearing. Another theater became very popular just after World War II and through the 1950s and 60s. And it involved our automobile. You remember those? Drive-in theaters. 
How many remember going to the drive-ins? How many will admit to me taking your friends in the trunk of the car? Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Great memories, aren't they? Do you know that in 1956, Minnesota had 113 open drive-ins? How many do you think we have today? We have five. We have five open today in Minnesota. Probably. Do you know where that one is? I'm trying to remember. This theater is one of the five still open in Minnesota. There's a little town way up in northwest, not all the way to St. Vincent, where my friend back here is from, but it's getting pretty close. Uh, this is out near Warren, Minnesota, out in the Red River Valley, um, and they still run, first run movies in the summertime at the drive-in. I remember my dad forgetting to take the speakers off the windows. Remember you drive away? <laughs> Whoops. Most of the stanchions are gone, the memories are disappearing every year, and the snack bars, here's an old screen, the last reminder of the drive-in days of the 50s and 60s. It's near Niswa, north of Brainerd. Here's another historic landmark that's disappearing off the landscape all too fast, country stores. How many remember going to a country store? Walk in a country store and the, the floors have that great slant. <laughs> remember that? The pot belly stove in the back. Great glass cases you could stand there and, and look at all the, the candy. Pickle barrels. Pickle barrels, there you go, crackers. A few of them are still around. This is one of my favorite. It's out in Winona County. It's called Fremont. Little Crossroads has a country store. I stopped at the store one afternoon and met Helen. She owns a store and she has for over 50 years. She invited me in and I said, where do you live? She says, she points right behind her. She says, up those back steps. I live above the store. She says, it's the best burglar alarm I could ever buy. She said, this store goes back to the 1880s. You know, these were kind of great little stores, weren't they? You could get everything here, couldn't you? On the same shelf, you could buy a bag of flour, some licorice, shampoo, and a gopher trap. They were the Walmarts of the country. I said, Helen, do you mind if I take some pictures? She said, go right ahead. I have people stop by periodically asking for that, so you go right ahead. I went out with my camera, and I was out there taking my pictures and a few minutes later she came out the door holding two bottles of her homemade root beer. We sat on the steps of the old Fremont store and drank root beer and talked about the good old days according to Helen and I thought I died and went to heaven. I asked her about the, as we were sitting on the steps there, I asked her about the, the pump, the gas pump. I said, you only have one gas pump. She said, oh, we've only always had one gas pump as long as I can remember. In the old days, it was a hand crank kind. Some of you remember the hand crank gas pumps? She said it used to say Ethel on it. I said, is that your name? She just rolled her eyes. She wouldn't even answer me. It's a great old store, one of the last few left in Minnesota. I found another one, though, that I really like. And it's north of St. James, Minnesota. It's called the Nelson Elbin Store. It's one of the oldest stores in Minnesota. In fact, it's the oldest cooperative store still standing in the state. How it worked was people would bring things in on trade. Very little cash in the early days was exchanged because you could bring things in and take things out based on what you brought in. And you kept records in big leather-bound ledger books so, for example, if you had chickens on your farm, you could bring eggs in. 
then you could take things that you needed out on a barter system. We should try that again at Cub. <laughs> Bring things in, see if they'll let you take things out. No, nah, probably not. I went into the store and talked to the owner and couldn't help but notice the high-tech cash register that they had just purchased. <laughs> now, can you imagine the clerk at Cub or Rainbow ringing up your groceries with that? When you worked at the country store in St. James, you had to uh, know how to count change back, didn't you? <laughs> no, this one isn't going to do it for you. Another interesting landmark in my travels I like to find are, are the old railroad depots that dotted the small towns and communities all throughout Minnesota. How many remember traveling on the train? When you could take a train from town to town, can you do that today? No, there's one train you can take in Minnesota. It's the Amtrak, and it stops at about three towns, four towns in Minnesota, and that's about it. But there was a day when you could get a train in Minneapolis and you could take it to Wilmer. You could take a train to Duluth. You could take a train to Rochester. You wanted to go to Mankato and out to South Dakota, you could go that route too. Not anymore. These train depots are the last reminders of those days when you could take a train. And this is obviously in Fairfax, Minnesota. Remember the hustle and bustle on the, on the platform of these train depots? How many remember waiting for relatives to come home for Christmas? You'd go down to the train sta station to pick them up. Maybe some of you also remember seeing a brother, maybe a father, go off to war, saying goodbye on the, on the platform of the train depot. They were gathering places for families and communities. Most of these depots are gone. There's an interesting story of a depot. It's not here in Minnesota, but I want to quick share it. How many have ever heard of North Platte, Nebraska? And how many have heard about that wonderful story about the train depot? Some of you have heard that? There was a train depot in North Platte, Nebraska that, that served a very important role during World War II. Over six million servicemen passed through North Platte, Nebraska during the war years going east or going west. The train would always stop for refueling at North Platte. While they stopped for generally about 15 or 20 minutes, the communities in central and north central Nebraska would bring sandwiches, coffee, juice, and other things to the servicemen and fed them. Are there anyone here that was on one of those trains? My friend from St. Vincent was on that train. Do so you remember North Platte? Oh, okay. But there was a lot of fellows that went through and always remembered the train depot. The train depot today has unfortunately been tore down. Are you familiar with the one at Curry, Minnesota? Curry, Minnesota. What a great town. <laughs> oh, I know. I know the area very well. Depot? Oh, I gotta check that out. I've not seen that yet. Wonderful. Be well worth it. Curry. Next time I'm down there, I'll stop into that great little Irish town of Curry. <laughs> How many remember the old Milwaukee Road Depot? It's still there, that's right. But you know it was slated for demolition. They've saved it. They've, they've now built a hotel and a water park and an ice skating rink there. You can, you can go ice skating at the old train depot today. <laughs> but you know that in its heyday, the old Milwaukee Road had 29 trains daily to and from Chicago. In 1963, I, I got lost, and this is a true story. My mom, my brothers and sisters, I got lost coming from Chicago. I got on the wrong train. I got on the train going to Milwaukee. My mom can't explain how I got separated from the family, but I went to Milwaukee. They put me on a train 
to Minneapolis from Milwaukee, and I came in here when I was three years old. I hardly remember it, but my mom waited for me at the old Milwaukee Depot when I was three, so I have a personal story with that one. These train depots are great reminders of that era. Here is the depot in Thief River Falls, or if you're Norwegian, you call it Thief River Falls, right? Used as city offices today. Most of the depots are gone, and once in a while I'll find a reminder of those rail eras. The water towers, when the steam engines required water to operate. This is one of the few wood water towers steam for the steam trains left in Minnesota. Anyone ever see it? This is in the town of Carver, Minnesota. How many remember the show, The Petticoat Junction? That was their swimming pool, wasn't it? <laughs> Steam engine would roll in, and they'd drop that spout, and they would fill it up. And the, the train had to have water to produce steam to drive the pistons for the, for the, for the engine. What do you think that is? I heard boarding house, I heard hotel, and good guesses, but they're both wrong. Not a library? Is it a Not a barn? Well, it's used as apartments today, but what do you think it served when it was first built in 1895? Yeah, that's right. It was a hospital. You ever heard of the little town called Starbuck? has got one of the oldest standing hospitals left in Minnesota. It was a 13-bed hospital. Today, it's been turned into apartments, but for a number of years in the 60s and 70s, they almost destroyed this building. One of the quickest ways you can destroy a historic landmark, short of putting a match to it, is do what they did at the hospital in Starbuck. They operated a Halloween haunted house out of it. I was reading the diaries of the doctor that worked here at the turn of the century. They've been preserved at the Pope County Historical Society. It's interesting to read life of a country doctor. He went on to write about his experiences and he said, I delivered every baby in the county, I think. And he said, but the diff most difficult calls I ever got was when I would get the telegram to come out to a farm for the farm accidents. And I think sometimes we can over-romanticize history a little bit. And we got to realize when you read those, you realize how tough life was. When he would be called to the farm accident, yeah, he would never get there in time. The machinery <coughs> took life and limb, didn't it? on the farm. And he writes in pretty graphic detail about his experiences being a doctor a hundred years ago, operating out of this 13-bed hospital. Jail. Not a jail. No. Good guess. It's a very unique, one-of-a-kind landmark, one that you won't find anywhere else in Minnesota. Not a pump house, not a post office. It is the only remaining Civil War recruiting station left in Minnesota. There's a small little town not too far from Manterville. We were in Manterville for that old courthouse, remember, a few slides back? A little town called Wazioja. I didn't just make that up. Wazioja is a small, sleepy town that has the only Civil War recruiting station left standing. Men from the 2nd Regiment of Dodge County, 2nd Minnesota Regiment, <coughs> signed up to go to war in this little station. Most of the men, there was 232 of them, most of them were attending college at a little seminary, the oldest college in Minnesota at the time. It's not there anymore, but uh, 
They were attending seminary and they all went off to fight in the Civil War. The 232 men signed up to go here and their names are still on the muster log. They went off and the pageantry of sending men off to war at that time with banners and bands and, and music and farewells. But the men, most of them never returned and Wazioja basically folded up and it's a ghost town today. The men's first campaign was the Battle of Chickamauga in the Civil War. Two-thirds of the men were casualties from Wazioja. The other third were captured, spent the remaining years of the war in Andersonville Prison in South Georgia. And if you know your Civil War history, that was not a place you wanted to spend any time. When the 80 men left Andersonville, they boarded a steamboat at the end of the war. The steamboat was coming up the river and had a boiler accident near Quincy, Illinois. The steamboat blew up and the men drowned. Wazioja never recovered. I took this picture and I was back there and I asked one of the locals, I said, where is the old seminary? It was a different time of the year I went back and he said, well, you have boots in the car, walk back into the woods and you'll see the ruins. He said it burned down mysteriously in about 1911, according to what they can remember. I walked back into the woods and, and that is the ruins of the old college. This story is one that has been kind of lost to Minnesota history. It's one I think is worth telling though. There's a lot of these little stories about towns and communities that never make the the headlines and the big books and things, but they're the ones that I find when I'm traveling around looking around for Minnesota history. And this is one of my favorite stories, although it is a tragic story. That, by the way, is our jail. <laughs> more interesting, or not a more interesting, but a, more, a little lighter humored story is the, the little jail here in the small town of Walters. Walters sits along the Iowa border. Uh, west of Albert Lee. <coughs> Beautiful day, I stopped in town. I was going to take this picture, and there was a man working on a lawnmower across the, the road from the jail near his house, and I rolled the window down, and I asked him if I could check out his jail. He said, sure, go right ahead. The door is wide open. Well, I knew they weren't using it anymore, so <laughs> I went in, and it's a great little one-cell jail. You remember the show in the 60s and 70s? You guys all watched it, I'm sure. How many remember Gunsmoke? Isn't that a classic television show? Remember the, the, the jail? Felt like I'd walked back onto the set of Gunsmoke. I sat down in, in the cage. I shut the door. It didn't lock behind me, thank you. But it uh, made that wonderful clanging sound. And I thought about all the people that must have spent the night in the old jail over the years. And the old man working on the lawnmower came in a few minutes later because I was still in the jail and he wondered what happened to me. <clears throat> he saw me there sitting on the cot, just kind of taking all the history in. He said his dad told him stories. He was, this man now is about 75 years old, but he said, my dad used to tell me stories of this jail. When I was a little boy and before, when my dad was growing up here in Walters, this jail was very, very active during prohibition. <laughs> they would lock up people for running liquor, corn liquor by the way, across the Iowa border. Now I don't know if they were running liquor to Minnesota or vice versa, but the Walters Jail was very active in those gangster days of the 20s. How many are like me like to just wander old cemeteries? Interesting just to see old cemeteries, isn't it? I like reading old stones and think about the people and the history that a cemetery can tell us. And one of my favorite places and favorite cemeteries to walk, it's a beautiful cemetery, is a cemetery on the outskirts of the town of Winona. In this cemetery is one of the most unique stones you'll find in the state of Minnesota. It is a stone of the only Revolutionary War veteran to be buried in Minnesota. This man 
was 100 years old when he died in Minnesota. But he fought as a young man. He was 18 years old. He fought with the American regiment known as the Ethan Allen Green Mountain Boys. And he helped liberate the fort in New York called Ticonderoga. Thus, his memorial stone is built to represent the fort that he helped liberate from the British in upstate New York. And he's the only veteran to make it as far west as Minnesota. Great story, and uh, again, a great piece of Minnesota history. In all the towns I go through, I enjoy finding their water towers. You all know where this one is, right? Prospect Park, right. It's, it's technically in Minneapolis, but it sits kind of right there on the border between Minneapolis and St. Paul. And, and the Prospect Park water tower has a great history to it. It was built in 1913. Why do you think they put an observation deck at the top of the water tower? And it wasn't to look for Russian airplanes, by the way. You know what they thought they would do? They thought they would hold band concerts at the top of the, the water tower. July 6, 1913, when they had the grand opening of the, the water tower, by the time the men and women carried the bass drums, the tubas, and things up the stairs, they were so winded they couldn't play for 30 minutes. They have never had another band concert at the top of the water tower in their history. But it certainly stands as a landmark in Minnesota, doesn't it? How many have been to Freeport? Eaten at Charlie's? Freeport's got a great little water tower, and many towns have water towers like this one here. What do you think the nickname for these water towers is? I want you to think of the movie The Wizard of Oz. Yeah, they're called Tin Man water towers. Rochester is where the corn cob water tower is, yes. You all been to Lindstrom? We have some very clever, creative water towers around the state. Now, I do an entire presentation on country churches in Minnesota, so I won't dwell on that subject very long, but I just want to mention how important our old churches are as historic landmarks and vanishing landmarks. And you know, it's not only we lost our landmarks years ago, we're losing them all the time, even today. It's the old St. Patrick's Catholic Church, one of the oldest churches in Rice County, west of Faribault in a little town called Shieldsville. In the summer of 2003, Shieldsville experienced a thunderstorm lightning struck the tower of old St. Patrick's. 125-year-old church, in the matter of minutes, goes from this to this. A historic landmark gone forever. By the time the men could get, the fire department could get out from Faribault to Shieldsville, get the pumper truck down to the lake to get the water, because they don't have fire hydrants in Shieldsville. The church was gone. A historic landmark disappeared overnight. Now, none of us can control lightning. Those things happen. And churches are really susceptible to lightning because of their tall spires. And but we can control our own foolishness. How many remember about nine or 10 years ago in one of my favorite little towns in Minnesota called Lanesboro, the police chief decides to impress his girlfriend. You remember that news story? And he starts a fire, doesn't he? And before he can control it, the fire gets out of control. And two historic buildings in downtown Lanesboro are gone forever. Never to be enjoyed by the next generation. Now. Whether you agree with this or not, but what do you think this man is doing today? He's making your next license plate. 
No, I don't know. Is he out now? Oh, no, he did. But it's sad. We've lost part of our historic downtown Lanesboro. I don't like to end on that note. I want to share a, a positive story. How many remember that wonderful story of that little church out in western Minnesota three summers ago that, that was moved? Yeah, it was moved up to a little Bible camp in New London, Minnesota, called the Shores of Lake Andrew. The little marble Lutheran church out by Canby was scheduled to close. Couldn't afford to keep a full-time pastor, so they decided we had to close our little church been standing there for over a hundred years. They found a buyer for the church. It was a Bible camp looking for a chapel. They agreed to sell them their, their church for the whopping sum of one dollar. They sold the church and here's the inside. They moved it, they put it on a flatbed truck and drove it 100 miles across the prairies of western Minnesota, 20 miles a day. Elwood, the church treasurer, who I met that day, I took pictures before they moved the church, he said, I have to tell you what we did. He said, at the closing of the deal for $1, he said, we decided to close the bank account of the church and give the bank account balance to the Bible camp to help defray some of the cost of moving the church. Elwood slipped him a check for $70,000. Elwood's in the red suspenders, by the way. And here's the church on a flatbed truck heading across the prairie. It's parked, actually, there. Those are my headlights, so I could get this picture. They parked it at night. They couldn't move it at night, but they could move it 20 miles a day during the daytime. I think this is one of the most success stories of preserving a historic building in Minnesota in a long, long time. How many enjoy old barns? <laughs> to me, those are great historic landmarks that we're losing every year, and I'd like to kind of conclude with that. Now, I put it to music, so don't worry, I didn't sing, but I want you to enjoy the, uh, the music and enjoy the pictures of old barns and farmsteads here in Minnesota. And if you grew up on a farm or spent time on a farm, maybe you'll have some good memories of that too.